Fun Ideas Productions presents the Fun Ideas Podcast. This is the Slow Poisoner. I come to you from the future with these words of warning. It's a hot horror planet. It's a hot horror planet. It's a hot Hi, this is Mark Arnold, and welcome to Fun Ideas Podcast number 88. This episode is sponsored by the fine folks at Lee's Comics. Attention comic book fans, Lee's Comics of Mountain View, California has closed. But here's the good news. Lee's Comics eBay store is still going strong with over 10,000 vintage comics, the majority of which are now on sale for half off. Choose from Lee's huge stock of golden, silver, bronze, and modern age comics, and specializing in Silver Age Marvel titles. You can count on friendly service, accurate grading, and quick, secure shipping backed by a money-back guarantee. To check out Lee's eBay store, go to eBay. Click Advanced Search to the left of the search bar, scroll down to Sellers, and enter Lee's Comics, Inc., period. That's L-E-E-S-C-O-M-I-C-S. INC period. Don't forget the period. Lee's Comics is shipping daily with no delays. New items daily. Mention the Fun Ideas podcast and get a free bonus gift. Long title, Looking for the Good Times, Examining the Monkey Song One by One by Michael A. Ventrella and Mark Arnold. A book that examines each song, gives lots of details about each song and our own personal opinions. You can find this book on Amazon, Barnes & Nobles, and anywhere where good books are being sold. Our webpage is wordpress.monkeys.com, where you can see many of the songs and give your own opinions of them. And we will be discussing this more on Zilch. Hey, Michael, it says here we've written another book about the monkeys. Wasn't the first one enough? Not at all, Mark. Our original book, Looking for the Good Times, Examining the Monkey Songs One by One, was very successful, but only covered half the story. Which half? The group half. Our new book, Headquartered, A Timeline of the Monkey's Solo Years, covers the solo half. Who knew the monkeys record so many solo albums? Not only that, but this book covers all of their solo projects, including stage shows, horse racing, running record labels, directing and starring in TV shows and movies, voice acting, and jail. Jail? Did the monkeys go to jail? Ah, you have to read the book to find out. You sold me. Have you sold them? Who, who, who's them? Those people out there listening to this. Well, listen to this. This book has discographies, photos, and other information about the prefab for Mickey, Davey, Peter, and Mike, the solo monkeys, plus another nifty cover by Scott Shaw. Wow, he did our last cover, and this one's equally good. Where can you get this masterpiece? Announcer. Announcer? That's me. <clears throat> Get Headquartered, a timeline of the monkey solo years, written by Michael A. Ventrella and Mark Arnold. Those two guys. It's available in hardback, paperback, or ebook from BearManorMedia.com or from Amazon. Get your copies today. Cool. I'm going to get one today. Currently, I'm working on my Mad and Disney books as well as articles on the Pink Panther and on Popeye for Back Issue magazine. Our guest today co-wrote Mouse Tracks, the story of Walt Disney Records. He's worked for Disney, writes for Cartoon Research, and is an avid collector of children's albums and soundtrack albums. Here he is, Greg Airbar. All right, on the phone today we have Greg Airbar. How are you, sir? I'm very well, thank you. All right, and as we usually do on the Fun Ideas podcast... Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got interested. Jeez, you've done a lot of different things. Well, we'll start off with children's music, but uh, <laughs> you could tell that Archie story we were talking about offline. So uh, go for it. <laughs> well, you know, I, I'm, I'm interested in the, quite a bit of things, but uh, I've always been interested in uh, anime. 
animation, TV, comedy, uh, music, all kinds of things. But my interest in records for kids began when I was a kid. And I collected Disney, Hanna-Barbera, Golden, Happy Time, uh, uh, Peter Pan, and all those things from the 78s and 45s and the LPs. And when uh, I reached the age where they said, what are you listening to baby records for? I said, because they're good and they're pieces of art. And then all the other kids said, you want my kitty records? And I said, sure. And then a uh, wonderful thing called eBay came along in the 90s. And I, that's where I found a lot of the ones that I was looking for. Because between that and the days before, it was a treasure hunt to find a lot of right. them. <laughs> and and the, thing that, the reason I, I love them is because... Uh, a record, a good record for kids, despite whatever the budget is, even if it's a low, low budget record, um, if it's done well, it truly is a wonderful uh, piece of, of work with, with wonderful talent in it. And uh, the best ones are eclectic. And so I think kids should be brought up with, even now, brought up with every kind of music, every kind of music. Yeah. Uh, and with uh, with also with radio style audio drama and comedy without a picture, because even if you listen to a the soundtrack directly from a movie or a show, it is a completely different experience. Uh, it, your your senses are heightened right. when you hear pure audio. You you focus more on the music, the dialogue, and the sound effects. Uh, because I listen to the Cole Picks records <laughs> with just the soundtrack of Dennis the Menace or Top Cat, for example, I really love the nuances of character and what a lot of the voice actors could do when they would bend the words like Dawes Butler and mm -hmm. Mel Blanc. Anna Waldo and things like that, the, the masters and so, and the people of today also. So even the cartoons that we might say, well, they're not as good as this or they're not as good as that or whatever, I don't feel that way mm -hmm. because there's something about them, especially in the audio uh, with the performances and with the music and even the sound effects that become iconic that mm -hmm. I think about them. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, the inevitable question is... Uh do you have a favorite? <laughs> well, let me put it this way. Out here in Southern California, things can burst into flames at a moment's notice. <laughs> so um, I have a little, we have a, we have to keep a, a part of the, of our, of our home set apart where we have all of our, our family pictures, our important papers and certain important things that we have to toss in the car. And like Raymond Land and his family in that Panic in the Year Zero movie, <laughs> when the new fallout was approaching, you have to drive away from the, the red sky. Mm -hmm. And I had to do that. And so I have a, a, a box that I keep my special <laughs> And mm -hmm. they're not Necessarily the rarest ones. They're yep. the ones with autographs on them, and they're the ones that I just love, and I don't want to lose my vinyl copies of. So right. some of them are uh, things like uh, the Rocky and His Friends album, oh, yeah. once, um, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, <laughs> Charlotte Webb, uh, The Flying Nun. It's a particular <laughs> fit. Um, I think I've got a chipmunk or two in there. I, I, it's, I'm looking at the box now. I could get it and read it off to you, but there are certain puffin stuff is, is a, mm -hmm. one of the best contracts ever made from the movie, uh, the, uh, the daydreamer. Mm -hmm. So there are certain ones that I just, I just find personally that I love, uh, regardless of what their relative value is, because yeah. one people will ask you, when you when you know music and records is I have this record what is it worth yeah. what's it worth and also what's it worth to the person who might be interested in buying it and that's a totally arbitrary thing right um, right uh, it's it's like saying you know what how do you measure love and things it, it's just something that that's it, it's it's impossible to really say and even if about eBay and and things like that, it fluctuates. 
So all I know is this is what I like. And, uh, oh, the Alice in Wonderland album by Darlene Gillespie and Tutti Camerata, which I consider yeah. the great album ever made. Mm -hmm. That's in that's in the box, and that's I listen to that hundreds and hundreds of times uh, when I'm sad, happy, uh, and I like they say you can't take it with you, but with music you can because it's in your head. If you have any kind of consciousness after the we move on, the music's still going to be there. Right. Do you have a preference? I mean, nowadays there's like the resurgence of vinyl, but do you have everything like on a digitized copy just for easy listening or access? I have been digitizing again because in, here in Southern California, this paradise bursts in the flames every few minutes. And... <laughs> well, it did it up here too? I mean, it's like it was red skies up here in Oregon. Oh, so, <laughs> hey, yeah, I mean, I'm constantly contacting friends and saying, "Are you okay?" Because that's and they're the same with me. And then I have friends and relatives uh, elsewhere that are saying, "We're watching the news. Is that your house?" Mm -hmm. uh, but, thing because and, and and then when they send us and the, the police are coming down the street like it's 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 world war three saying evacuate immediately honestly it's it's terrifying and then you see then you watch the news from a motel and think is that our house right <laughs> you, you you have to be prepared so i have a hard drive and i all the time yeah all the time digitizing uh, my audio so that I have the hard drive if I need to. Um, or if we run into total financial ruin, which, you know, that could happen any day now, too, with everyone. <laughs> um, I at least have the hard drive if I have to um, uh, do away with all of the, the stuff, because stuff truly is an important. Um, uh, I mean, you say that, then your house is full of stuff. Yeah. But yeah. it's like, it's like money means nothing to me if you have it. Yeah. You know, title nothing if you have one. Right. I, I, I collectors, and I'm sure you know very right. well. There's collect, and so there's always difficulties with that. So, uh, but I have to be prepared. Plus, but I do, I do love vinyl. Uh, I love, I love the tactile aspects of the fact that you can watch it spinning around and. There's the sound going on in there. It's mm -hmm. magical. Yeah. You see the you see the rainbow colors, and it's inside there. It's like the cartoons are like happening in there. <laughs> and you, and even if and the nice thing is that even though vinyl has flaws in it, so do CDs, yeah. so do MP3s. They can fail. We we've been actually uh, going back and going through a lot of our DVDs, and sometimes they fail. Yeah. And we'll be something and it's like it'll just stop it's like what happened it, it just stopped yeah so you can't ever be sure with digital and you can't also be sure that you will have the means to play and from what i've been uh, studying up on uh, analog film and uh, recordings like records are are very easy to play in some way you can take a pin and a, and a cone of paper and play a record <laughs> yeah <laughs> but you can do that. You can make, you can build a record player from scratch, yeah. but you can't figure out how to create an entire digital system from scratch. Right. <laughs> the but. way they're replacing our equipment uh, so frequently with digital reproduction, uh, you would be best if you love your 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 vinyl to save the stuff that you that you love the most. Yeah. Uh, and if you want to have really really clean copies with no noise, then keep the digital as well. But I'm I'm thinking twice more with my my CDs than I am with my albums now. It's very it's very strange. Plus, there are programs like um, Click Repair, where you can run the the digital recording through Click Repair, and it takes out some of the crinkles, mm -hmm. which is quite. Yeah, I I still I don't know. I guess because I. Everything changed in the eighties. Uh, you know, I love CDs. You know, but uh, I still have a lot of my vinyl. So, but you know, it's like uh, you know, a lot of times the, the the good thing about CDs was you know they would re-release -re something with extra stuff that they never yes. put out before. So it's like oh. wow, you know, it's like but, but yeah, get rid of them either because they have the extra stuff. They have they have retrospective liner notes that that. 
the records don't have, so it's hard to part with those. Right. I will take a picture of the liner notes if I simply can't hang on to several copies of the same CD. I did it with the Partridge family. <laughs> I had two of, of, of some of the albums. It's like, well, I don't really need two, so I, I tested each and thought, well, this one kind of sounds better than the other one. Yeah. But I wanted the liner notes, so I took a picture of all the liner notes <laughs> and, and so I could get rid of the other one because right. I, I just can't keep everything. And CDs do pile up. They're small, but they do take up space. Everything takes up yeah, space. Yeah. Rec weigh a ton, and uh, the, so that that's an, that's an issue as well. Storage is also, and cassettes are also difficult to store because they're unwieldy. Yeah. Um, and you can't always depend on cassettes to retain their sound quality no. because they're they're tricky as well. So all of this stuff has its pluses and minuses. What I get a kick out of is how the industry quote experts keep saying vinyl is is just a passing thing. It's like saying television is yeah. a computer, and yet vinyl is still out there. Yeah. And well, I was kind of mad when it went away because uh, what I what I tended to collect, I, I I would buy things sporadically in the '70s because I was a kid, uh, but in the '80s is when my big collecting started, and I would collect vinyl albums, vinyl singles, and CDs, and I loved vinyl singles because I didn't want to buy a whole album just for one song or whatever, and you know sometimes people would do some goofy novelty record or something, and that's the only way you got it was on a vinyl single and then it was like it seemed like January 1st 1990 we are no longer going to have any vinyl singles and they just went away immediately you know and it's like now you can get them every so often on record store day and they're like 20 bucks a pop and it's like I want my one dollar ones I like those yeah. remember you went into Woolworths and it was like uh you, you they were like a dollar dollar 29 yeah. sitting there that's because the pressing plants went away yeah and there are only so many and their demand is so high it's possible that maybe the demand will increase so that they'll open some more pressing plants and the price will go down because uh, that's what happened with home video is the price was high and then the demand went up but who knows um, it just seems like the industry never they they seem to want to force the hand mm -hmm. even when uh, seems to want what they want. It's like, well, we, we will tell you what to want. Yeah. And the public keeps pushing back and saying, yeah, but this is what we want. And it's sort of like this tug of war sometimes with media and sometimes with content too. Um, uh, though I'm not, I'm not, I don't like the word content. I remember when John, John Stewart on the Daily Show said something like, oh yeah, I remember when I was a kid and I was sitting there and watch hours of content. But, <laughs> It's, it's so, it's so, uh, uh, you know, anyway, um, no, I, I, I understand that. And I also went uh, getting back to kids records in the eighties, they completely eliminated vinyl early because kids and parents were buying cassettes for the car as well as for the yeah. home. So the, with read alongs, there were no more vinyl issues. So companies like Disney and Peter Pan, we're only putting out cassette versions, right? And that was frustrating because not only is it harder to find them now in their complete original packaging, but they don't always sound good. You have to you have to almost buy more than one sometimes to get one that doesn't sound muffled. Mm -hmm. Because you're, yeah. it's the luck of the draw with the quality of a cassette. Some of them sound terrific even now, but some of them just don't and they may not have even sounded that good in their day right but there's no choice i just did a post on uh, cartoon research because i have this um regular uh, column about uh, records with animation and i did the aristocats and i forgot when i was writing about the read-along from 1987 because i was looking for my vinyl copy <laughs> and i couldn't find it. and i looked on ebay and i couldn't find it and then it occurred to me I had to get this on cassette, and I remember being really ticked that I couldn't get away. Yeah. Uh, and then there's a series of wonderful fairy tales that Disney put out, narrated by Marvin Kaplan. Wow. <laughs> Top Cat. He yeah. does a beautiful job, but they never came out on vinyl. And so that's a difficult thing to find where they sound terrific, hmm. because some of 
time. So it was a frustrating time. And the reason I first bought a CD player was because The Little Mermaid originally was the first album that only came out on CD and cassette. And I just didn't like the cassette. It mm. just the, sort of break down when you turned it up. And so I broke down and got a, uh, a CD player. And then, of course, the room filled with CDs because then you wanted to hear what things sounded like on CD right. because there was background noise. However, the other thing to consider, too, is the quality of the engineering and mixing. Yeah. Some The album still sounds better Sometimes the CD sounds better. There's a guy named Randy Thornton who oh, yeah. is Barry mm -hmm. at Walt Disney Records because he makes everything sound better because he he just puts his heart and soul into that and he restores soundtracks and a lot of things are on uh, CD and digital because of him. You know, there was no soundtrack of Alice in Wonderland. 101 Dalmatians, Lady and the Tramp, The Aristocats, Robin Hood, until Randy really pushed for it. Yeah. And so what he does, and with, with the vintage <coughs> album. Excuse me. So sometimes they sound better mm -hmm. after done things to them. Uh, so when you buy now the vinyl pressings that Disney puts out, you're actually getting Randy's digital versions pressed on vinyl. So you're getting the value of the vinyl sound combined with the digital sound, and that's pretty cool as well. Right. Now, the, <laughs> there's like a zillion questions, I was saying, but I'll stick on this topic since we're on it. Um, there was a like a high-end line of Disney soundtracks that were made basically during the 50s, maybe into the 60s a little bit. Were those of a better quality, kind of like what Randy did, or even were those kind of inferior? I don't have too many of those. I think I have Sleeping Beauty is the only one. Well, those were the initial line of soundtracks when Disneyland Records began in 1956. Okay. The person responsible for those was one of my heroes, Tutti Camerata. Mm. He came up through every aspect of the music business. He was educated at Juilliard. He worked with all of the biggest stars of show business, Bing Crosby, Ella Fitzgerald, Billy Holiday, uh, everybody. And he, but he was never uh, talking about himself very much. He was all about the work and the quality of the music. And he knew classical, big band, jazz. Um, he, he moved into rock and roll and pop when, when Annette came along. He could do any kind of music. Mm -hmm. And it was reflected in the Disney records that came out in the 50s and 60s and early 70s. So they were very lucky to get him. But one of the things he had was this extraordinary musical ear. Mm -hmm. So when they had him do the soundtracks, back in those days, there was no video. So on the studio lot, they ran the films for him. And then they were very surprised to see that he closed his eyes <laughs> and didn't want the movie. And he did that for a reason, because yeah. he wanted to focus, like I was just saying, on the audio. And he was like a man named Goddard Lieberson at the Columbia Records who developed the format and the, the kind of invented the original cast album for Columbia. He was, he was the person responsible for formatting the original soundtrack album because before that most soundtracks and I, unless i'm mistaken i mean to my experience most soundtrack albums were constructed for air for airplay and for jukebox play mm -hmm. so if you look at old mgm records they were not necessarily in chronological order most of the songs played about three minutes they because they needed to be put on 78s and 45s. Mm -hmm. So they, were arranged, they weren't arranged necessarily uh, like a show. They were, there was not much overture. There was some background music if it was really crucial, like a dance sequence, things like that. But there wasn't a format of music singing, music singing. Uh, so what Tootie did is he put, because of his classical background, and because he worked with people like Paul Whiteman, who combined jazz with classical, um, the Rhapsody in Blue was actually written for Paul Whiteman mm. by Gersh, and he, he worked for Paul Whiteman. So that kind of background was really unique. 
So he developed this format of, of creating a soundtrack album that, again, it wasn't like the others. It wasn't necessarily in sequence, but it was designed so it played on a vinyl record with a beginning, a middle, of, and an end, like a concert, like a suite, so that if, if a piece needed to be moved around or something needed to be edited from a different scene, it was for the sake of the listening experience. One of the things about a record is the outside of the disc has greater clarity than the inside. Mm -hmm. the, the bass tones particularly are stronger on the outside of the disc because there's there's more groove moving around. It's mm. going actually faster and it's almost it's almost it's going practically at a different speed. So when you get to the center groove nearer to the, the hole, the spindle hole, mm -hmm. you're actually getting less clarity, more, it's a little more tinny. And for example, that's why on the Sound of Music album, Climb Every Mountain mm -hmm. is on the side. That's because it's a, it's a song for, it's, it's, it's mostly a singer's song and it has the high notes, but it doesn't emphasize bass tones. Mm. And that's when you see a movie sometimes, you say, how come the songs aren't in the, the actual order? It's because mm. the record album was designed by what needed to fit where on the album. And that was largely Tutti Camerata's uh, feeling. So the albums in 1956 and 57 that came out from the animated uh, features uh, were, and eventually the live action ones, were all produced by him. Mm. And the original ones were roughly 35 to 40 minutes long. And the other thing they did, and this wasn't as successful, is if you look at the covers and the strength of the covers, they were on very, very strong cardboard. Yeah. Uh, the front covers were very painterly. They were done by, they were always done by Disney artists, usually, at least in the 50s. But they were done to appeal to adults, mm -hmm. to look very serious. Um, they were usually a little darker and more they they, did, they they had characters but they didn't emphasize them quite so much it was more about the color and the tone mm -hmm. so those were being they they thought we'll sell these in the soundtrack and original cast sections but it didn't work they were they mm -hmm. were expensive for their day and stores put them with the kid records <laughs> it was this and so they didn't sell very well. The record company was running at a deficit for a while, and they were still finding themselves. The Mickey Mouse Club stuff sold well, but that was originally on the ABC label, Ampar. Mm -hmm. Eventually it went over to Disneyland as well. Um, and certain things did okay, but the soundtracks weren't doing great. Then the storytellers came along, and they would cut up the music and the, some of the dialogue, mm -hmm. and those started picking things up. But what happened was, now the sound quality was always great because 2D had that ear. Um, sometimes some reverb was added because not only does the reverb kind of cover the edits, but we were talking about soundtracks that were from the 30s and the 40s. Mm -hmm. and they, had to, they were given what they had to work with. Mm -hmm. So you didn't have the capabilities that you have now. So kind of, sometimes reverb was all you had. There wasn't the tracking and the, the enhancements. So what happened was in 1959, they faced uh, a situation where they had to lower costs. So the soundtracks were edited mm. and aimed at kids. So many of them were shortened to between 20 and 30 minutes. The covers were changed and they were emphasizing the characters. The col colors were brighter and they did really well from that point on. Things started picking up at 59 between that stuff, and they were $1.98, yeah. mm -hmm. and kids were uh, buying them. They were where they should have been in the kids' section, and then Annette came along, and that's a whole other story. <laughs> but that's kind of why that was. But if you can find them, they're usually pricey. Yeah. In fact, the Wonderland album was not a soundtrack because they didn't have the rights to it. Hmm. Uh, Death records did and the movie didn't do well so Decca never made a soundtrack and in order for Disney to do it they would have had to purchase all of the licensing and the the fees the music fees the musician fees and it was it was actually so cost prohibitive that it was just as easy 
and actually artistically kind of interesting to do a brand new album. And it's an outstanding album, and it stands on its own as a completely different piece mm -hmm. and an outstanding one. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why that was done in 57, and that was the one they sold for many, many years. And it wasn't until 1997 that Randy Thornton produced an actual soundtrack, and that probably costs quite a bit of money. Did they have to, when Randy did it, did he have to pay DECA or their successors? I guess it's UME or something now <laughs> to get the, the rights at that point, or how did that work? There was probably some kind, there was probably all kinds of deals to have to make because the music industry, as far as rights and, and fees, is unwieldy. Hmm. You know, any standard for, for, for the music industry. So you have to deal with all kinds of things. It is extraordinarily complicated. Uh, you probably know that that's the reason that Quick Draw McGraw still isn't released right. on DVD because yeah. of the, the Capitol, CLE Library, and uh, those various things. It, it, so many people own them, and it's, it's in so many hands, and they all want different prices. Right. So it's it, complicated. Uh, Alice by 1997. The other thing is, my philosophy is, okay, if you run into a brick wall, wait six months, a year, wait a couple, you know, circumstances change. It falls right. into different merge. By 97, it may have changed dramatically, and maybe that was the time to do it. Plus, Walt Disney Records was a different company. The, 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 they were riding high with, with the Beauty and the Beast and Little Mermaid and Aladdin, so they were in a, probably in a much better place financially to do it. Yeah. Now, a lot of these soundtracks, like, let's just start with Snow White, because that's the first kind of major uh, theatrical animated feature film. Um, how was that recorded in the first place? Well, it's kind of interesting that it was recorded very much like a silly symphony, because when you look at the silly symphonies, there is a very specific format to them, mm -hmm. all time to a musical beat. Everything in the silly symphonies is almost is, is pretty much moving to a musical beat. And if you look at the imitators by the other cartoon studios, they're all moving to a musical beat. And the first half is generally, okay, here's here's a, a world of happy bunnies or a world of happy flap, <laughs> and they're going about their business being happy. And then halfway through, okay, here's the problem they have, and here's and then comes the danger, and then here's how they solve it. And then they go back to being happy at the end, but it's all timed to that to that beat. Mm -hmm. Snow White broke with that in that there wasn't the obvious bouncing around in time with the music, but there still was that beat. Mm -hmm. The entire plan that way. And if you go back and listen to the music of the Silly Symphonies, you will still hear that tone because. The people behind Snow White, Frank Churchill and uh, Larry Morey and various other people who were also working behind the scenes on the music, did the same thing. They all came from the Silly Symphonies and they were trained on them, just like the animators were. There's not as much emphasis put on the audio on those films because they're so visually striking. Right. That don't even realize what's going on with the music because it's it's virtually invisible which it's kind of supposed to be yeah but the drama a lot of it's just like it's just like a star wars or a marvel movie turn off the sound and it's a lot of people running through hallways you know a lot of times <laughs> <laughs> i mean i don't I'm, I'm not i'm not meaning to minimize that but if you there is a lot of heavy lifting well yeah the music. the music does make star wars in a, in a tremendous sense i think they originally had an original trailer for Star Wars that didn't have any music on it or something, like a year ahead of the time or something, and it kind of fell flat with audiences because it didn't have that John Williams score, blah, 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 or whatever, you know. <laughs> so oh, well, I get it. <laughs> you know, John Debney, when he was working for Hanna-Barbera, when he did the Jetsons movie, the Universal people, well, I, I mean... <laughs> But poor Mark Evanier is having to tell the Jana Waldo story again. But then Universal was not only pushing Tiffany, <laughs> but they want me to open with a Tiffany song. And John Debney very carefully, you know, because he wasn't in charge, but he was the, the, the composer, said, 
this the theme song is iconic and he said trust me please and they just kept saying yeah but we have this big musical star let her open it with a song and he said but this song the theme song is so iconic and they relented but he said trust me there will be a cheer when the song opens and i was in the theater yeah and I remember when that, that musical note thing came on and then it swung around and it said Hanna-Barbera. I get the chills just thinking right, about it. Right, right. Yeah, I saw and, it on the big screen originally, too. And, yeah, that was, I hate to say, that was probably like the best part of the movie. Just the titles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. It was. It kind of was. You know, um, I, I saw the attraction at the parks, too, and they that the three seeing that in 3D was pretty exciting, too, because mm. you were going through the, the you know, you're going through outer space and the music was fun. That's got to be one of the greatest theme songs in the world. So, like I say, even going back to Snow White, animation and music is, is so powerful. Here's an interesting thing about Snow White, too. I was reading um, uh, very, very recently. It may have been a Jim Corcus uh article that Snow White was also so important musically and audio wise that they sent out Disney sent out a a uh, instruction sheet to theaters suggesting how they should position their speakers the kind of speakers they should have <laughs> levels they should set wow. because they want they they felt like and this is before Fantasia yeah. felt that they wanted the reproduction of the sound to be just so for the movie to affect audiences properly. Mm. That's that's really cool to think that even then they were thinking about stuff right. like that. I, I guess I'm still driving at something. What I'm trying to drive at, and let me just kind of explain myself is with Snow White and everything and mentioning these things. Uh, you said a lot of information about soundtracks and the differences and stuff. So I know, like, say, Frank Sinatra, Bing Crosby, even Elvis Presley, uh, they would record like versions of their songs on film, and then they'd have the artist go back into the studio and do another recording, and that would be, quote unquote, the soundtrack, which it really wasn't because it was not the one that you actually hear in the film. So why was that, and when did that change kind of occur where they said, oh, let's put the actual soundtrack you hear on the film onto a a record, you know, and I, th I, I think you might have just answered it because wouldn't Fantasia be the first one that they actually put the actual soundtrack onto a piece of vinyl plastic or whatever? <laughs> well, actually, Snow White was the very first original soundtrack album with the music uh, taken directly from the film. Mm -hmm. Now, there were some silly symphonies that were put on uh, Bluebird discs, mm -hmm. but as far as feature film, the original soundtrack album was was Snow White on Victor Records. Okay. And then when Dumbo were done that way as well. The Bambi soundtrack was not done music wise, but there was dialogue uh, on the Shirley Temple album. Uh, but the the very first Disney did it first. The first uh live action was Till the Clouds Roll By. Oh, okay which was an MGM musical about the life of Jerome Kern. Mm -hmm. And that was around, I think, 47, 48. But before that, you're absolutely right. What they would do, and, in, and, all, and on until the 60s, they would do what, what Disney called them second cast, but they did studio versions. Mm -hmm. And they had for, for any number of reasons. And in the old days, they did it for... The, for for jukeboxes, they didn't start playing records on radio until much later because the, there were rules about that. Mm. They played music live because radio was uh, mostly live until Bing Crosby changed that because he wanted to play golf and also because he wanted to he develop help develop <laughs> recording tape for that reason. He was the pioneer of that. He and uh, and Paul uh, uh, Les Paul. Uh, we have Bing Crosby to, to thank largely for financing and, and pushing for the development of that because his show was pre-recorded and shows were not, but I digress. <laughs> so, so soundtracks were done in that way. They, uh, a lot of times they were done, uh, they would do studio versions. The Wizard of Oz, there was no soundtrack. Decca did the songs with Judy Garland, but none of the rest of the cast. 
Yeah. So over there was was with Victor Young and his orchestra. Hans Christian Andersen with Danny Kay was also Victor Young, and they had um, Jane Wyman singing with him. Uh, White Christmas, no soundtrack. Right. Uh, very few were done that way all the way up until the 60s. And then in the 60s, like you said, Elvis did them that way. Henry Mancini would record his own versions. And there was also some albums that had a mix. Quite often, the the composer or the conductor would do their own version of the overture, especially for the album. They would sometimes, like on the Mary Poppins album, there are endings of songs that aren't in the movie. The yeah. overture at the very beginning of the movie it doesn't appear in the movie, but it ends on the on the LP, <laughs> um, which they used for the trailer, the, so that the song would end on the album, but mm -hmm. it, it continued, or it's like Spoonful of Sugar ends different on the album. They would usually do that in the sessions and stuff, but it would be specifically for the vinyl. So sing, things like that happened a lot. Yeah. Uh, it, it was for any number of reasons. They, I think Henry Mancini wanted each of his pieces to be self-contained because he liked to do those life motif. Yeah. If I, if I may be so erudite, <laughs> he wanted a piece of music to, to fit a character or a scene or a sequence. So he wanted each of the themes to stand alone mm -hmm. because he was so well known for creating those wonderful themes. And they they were woven through a film. They weren't necessarily standalone. That was another problem with Alice in Wonderland too, is that back uh, back then it was it was also cumbersome to create a record album from a movie where the songs generally were sporadic. Yeah, there were songs in Alice. It's it holds the record for more songs than any Disney feature. How many was that? You kind of cut out there a little bit. Oh. There were 14 songs. 14, oh, okay. I thought you said four, and I go, well, there's a lot more than four. <laughs> there's so many set pieces that are so big. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Some of them are sung in uh, just a few lines. Some of them are sung while people walk away. <laughs> you know? So it's, it, it's, it's just like just like the movie. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's madness. The yeah. songs are haphazard and crazy. What Randy did, was he tried to reconstruct the songs and the music um, in in the manner of the movie? Right. It wasn't to do that on a vinyl record, and it didn't necessarily work for a vinyl record. It was very hard to make that work yeah. properly to, to play like a record. Yeah. So that was another another reason uh, to to spend the money and try to make that work. Why not create something that played beautifully? as an album and good lord to me that one does so that was another another thing so so that there were a lot of reasons why uh, they had more control in the studio mm -hmm. sometimes uh, a sequence would the song would end abruptly to fit the scene uh, the 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 studios often when they were recording for the film they used a studio set up for the sound that wasn't quite as sonically sonically good mm -hmm. for the, the production of, of the film. Uh, Tutti Camerata opened his own studio because uh, Sunset Sound, which is still there, run by his son. Mostly for that reason. He mm. felt that there really weren't good, acoustically good sound, musical sound locations on the Disney lot. Mm. And he asked Roy, why don't you build one? And he said, Actually, it would be better if you did because we don't make recording, you know, rec records here. Right. Um, we do film sound recording, and it's different. He said, "If you open studio, we'll be your we'll be your client." <laughs> he was nervous about that because he was going to leave, leave a steady job, and uh, but it ended up being the best thing in the world, and he was grateful to Roy for the rest of his life right. for that. Mm -hmm. So, because he he his studio was to this day. A legendary place where they not only did Disney, but all the greatest groups and singers recorded there. But you have you have isolation booths, you have places for the singers, you have you have massive amounts of, of mixing boards specifically for sound, not for for film. Now that's not to say that on the Disney lot they don't have an orchestra right. uh, recording. They do. That's where they do the scoring. Right. But different. It's a huge room. It's specifically for an orchestra, you know. Another, you know what I mean. So it's yeah. it, the Sunset Sound has smaller rooms, 
for rock and roll bands and for soloists and it has an isolation chamber for spoken word and things like that mm -hmm. and so they can put somebody separate and they can they can do a, uh, a stereo track separately so there's a there are different needs for a for a, a music studio as opposed to a studio so that's why if you listen to a soundtrack album you'll sometimes hear a hiss because of about ambient sound uh, Sleeping Beauty is a very good example. <laughs> the Sleeping Beauty album is a combination of studio and soundtrack recording. The vocals of Once Upon a Dream, uh, I Wonder, and Hail to Princess Aurora, and The Overture are not the same as in the movie. Mm. And The Prince is a different singer yeah. than in the movie. See, as a kid, I'm going to interrupt there. As a kid, see, that used to bug me. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I can appreciate it now, but, I mean, I had this Wizard of Oz soundtrack, and I think it might have been the one you're talking about, but a later pressing, uh, that had Judy Garland on it, but none of the others. And I go, where are the others? And why does this not sound exactly right is what I heard in the movie. It just kind of pissed me off as a kid. Huh. <laughs> and it's like, what did they do to me? What says the Wizard of Oz? They lie, they lie. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And when you the nineteen the album that had the dialogue on it was cut down because they couldn't fit the whole movie on there. Right. <laughs> grew up with and that album was not released until nineteen fifty six when the movie was on the first year the movie was on television. Mm -hmm. So that was a major stride, but you wouldn't think it took, would take that long for, <laughs> for for it to get onto vinyl, but it did. Shirley Temple was just the opposite. Daryl Zanuck forbid Shirley Temple from recording anything, any of her songs, <laughs> because he believed that it would cut into the movie, the movie ticket sales. <laughs> this is this is cuckoo, the cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. But he thought <laughs> if we put out records, people won't go to see her movie. It'll cut back on her movie things. So all of the Shirley Temple records are all the same. They're all clippets of her songs pulled from the soundtracks. They weren't released until the 50s mm. when, when Fox had their own label. Then they put out albums with, with clips from her movies from soundtracks. But before that, there weren't any Shirley Temple records except the two Disney stories she recorded. Mm. And those were done in, in the 40s when she was much older. But as a kid, Right. There weren't any Shirley Temple records because Xanax said no. So that was just the opposite. I, I don't, <laughs> don't get it. Yeah. But <laughs> then, then of course, you know, as a kid, you know, you get those uh, Hanna Barbera records that were probably not done other than they got permission to do one. You know, so it's certainly not on Colpix or on Hanna Barbera's own label, and they got, you know. Joe Nobody doing the voice of Yogi Bear or whatever and stuff like that. And it's like, who's this? And they vaguely oh, yeah. sound like the, the character you grew up with. It's like, I didn't know the name Dawes Butler to save my life when I was a little kid, but I said, this doesn't sound right. Oh, yeah, yeah. And as a kid, it bothered me much more than as an adult. Um, the very first record I ever returned was a Happy Time record. <laughs> it was T movie favorites, and it was Huckleberry Hound on there. And at the time, I didn't know who Steve Clayton was, and I didn't know who Ralph Stein was. And, you know, as an adult, I know who they are, and I know the voice and all. And it's the album starts, and of course, my mom is in the room, and my brother, my older brother, and I'm so embarrassed. And here comes this flute and this organ, you know, and then this guy, it's all about today. It's like, oh, it's just, this is so not the theme. You're expecting this here. And and and, it, it, and so I went back to the gr grocery store where I got it and said, this isn't the real voices. And they, they gave me my money back. But, you know, to this day, I love the record now because it, it's nostalgic <laughs> for me. Um, and, and, and as far as the Golden Records and the, the, the Peter Pans, I understand why they had to do them. Hanna-Barbera didn't didn't mind. I mean, they, they're, they're fully licensed. They're fully approved. It was yeah. part of their plan uh Dawes Butler and and all, all those people were were contracted to Colpix because if you look at it from the standpoint of okay let's say you have the sound of music comes out so you got the original soundtrack album mm -hmm. and you got the original cast album with Mary Martin and then there's 10 other albums 
with you know Florence Henderson's version and, and <laughs> in, um, the the so and so singer's version. And because when something's popular, there are I don't want to say knockoffs. I want to say studio versions because sometimes major performers will do their version. Frank Sinatra does this one, and um, uh, Bobby Darren sings Doctor Doolittle. Yeah, it seemed like there's a lot of Doctor Doolittle ones. Yeah, <laughs> Sammy Dave did one. Yeah. You know, um, a great Dr. Doolittle album. And, uh, you know, he loved doing it so much, he made it into a party. It was a two-day session, invited his friends and family. They had food. It was it was a celebration doing that album. Mm-hmm. So those aren't necessarily bad things. Yeah. They're just... They're just cover versions, and in the again in the forties and fifties, when when a song came out, cover versions were normal. Yeah. Nobody really knew when Hanna Barbera cartoons were being made that it was going to be a problem. That it turned out to be that we kids were got so attached to those characters yeah. that it wasn't going to work as well. And Gil Mack, who did those voices, and then later uh, Gil Mack was the first, and then it was. Um, Oh, it was a couple of people. It was another guy um, oh, who did the pokey little puppy. It's Frank Milano, mm. who was on the Rudy show. Yeah, he, they they did most of those. And Gil Mack was a was a veteran of radio. All of these people were were extremely extremely experienced TV early TV uh, radio and stage actors. But you, they're in a no win situation. In fact, from what I read, Gil Mack really really tried and practice these characters but it's a no-win situation you're taking repeatedly it took like eight people to replace Dawes butler you're asking <laughs> one guy in new york to take on you know one another guy's capability of doing all these voices in a matter of a couple of weeks would probably with with very little there was no video so how much reference does he have you know yeah um, very little reference um, I remember Roby Lester was telling me. Roby Lester was the Disneyland story reader. Right. And back when she did those, they were those records cost sixty nine cents, the book and record sets. And you know she did the best she could, but she couldn't do every voice. And sometimes they didn't sound anything like them. And she read them like a mom was reading. <laughs> so she just did the best she could. And and so you know she did some or some she did well, some she did like you know your mom would do. Yeah. But she said, you know how I did those? She said, they'd hand me a stack of scripts. I would go in the booth and do them. Yeah. And she was method. She was trained. Uh, you know, she went to, to you know, she, she was a trained actress and singer. And she did what she could. She didn't have uh, DVDs of them. She didn't have videos of them. They didn't run a 16 millimeter print <laughs> for her. Yeah. She just, she probably hadn't seen them in a long time. They just handed her Pinocchio, Snow White, Mary Poppins, Cinderella, and said, okay, now go do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, so it all has to do with the circumstances. My feeling is you can tell when the people involved cared. Yeah. And were inspired. And, for example, the Jetsons Golden Record, I love that record. Yeah. I love it. And that, it, I'll, I'll, since you mentioned it, it, that was one that I, my tune changed about. It. Of course, I was a, a teenager to a young adult by that point, but uh, Dr. Domeno played clips from it once. I've got the push button. And I said, this isn't that bad. I can accept now that it's not George O'Hanlon. I can accept that it's not Penny Singleton anymore. Okay, I get it. You know, it's like, you know, they... You know, it's a different animal, but as a kid, you know, you're like, eh, this sucks, you know. <laughs> well, you know Rosemary June sang on a billion commercials. She sang um, in the Blondie theme, you know, pretty bass funny. Yeah, that's what Blonde, lovable people, that's her. Mm-hmm. She she was, she was sang demos for the biggest Broadway shows ever. Mm-hmm. She, I mean, she was, she was a pro. Herb Duncan what, did cartoon voices for Rankin Bass and for Hal Seeger. Mm-hmm. He was a noted stage actor. I met him when I started out in filmmaking. I, I, was a, uh, I, I was working for a company in Miami, and they said, you have to pick up the talent, Herb Duncan. And I'm like, it's George Jetson from the Golden Record. And they're like, what? <laughs> like a god to me and he, no one was more thrilled and, and they're saying herb is so excited that you're that you think he's the star right. and and 
and I brought my album for him to sign. He signed it in pen. You could hardly see his autograph, but, and he'd never heard it. It was 20 years later, mm -hmm. never heard. And I made him a recording. He played it for his kids. I mean, the man was so happy and I was so excited because, you know, I, I, I actually did. Even as a kid, I enjoyed Rammer Rammer Zoom. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that was the, that's the turning point on the thing. It's like if it's a quality recording, I mean, if it's a bad impersonation of Popeye, let's say, and then it's a boring record, then yeah. you're sunk, you know, but it's like if it's a halfway decent one and the story's not that bad or the songs, then you start saying, okay, I can forgive this a little bit. And then, hey, it's a different guy doing Popeye. Okay, cool. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, and, and the same with the HBR records, um, which I think are some of the greatest records period ever made. Mm -hmm. um, when they had the original cast, they could do no wrong. Um, like like when when they did Flintstones and things like that. But sometimes even when they didn't, I, I liked when Paul Fries did did Jinx. I mean, I would have loved to hear Dawes Butler do it, but Paul Fries did a completely different jinx, and when he started telling the story of Cinderella, he did it in such a great yeah. way. It's a really funny album. Yeah. Uh, when, um, when, when uh, let's see, you had... And to me, I, I love the Alice in Wonderland special so much that I don't mind Henry Corden <laughs> as Fred. Some people do, because I associate him with the records. Yeah. So to me... It's not he doesn't he doesn't play Fred the way Alan Reed did, but he did the record. So I, I still love Henry Corden. Yeah. Well, he um, ended up being Fred anyway, so it's kind of forgivable, I suppose. <laughs> he did. I was happy they chose him for that reason, and he did Fred even longer yeah. um, for for a long time, and so that was nice because it reminded me of the record albums, and and then they did a and and Dawes Butler did did. Um, Arnold Stang, because Arnold Stang, I think, had moved to New York. And that Robin Hood album is a really good album. Yeah. So, but then when they had the voices, like for the James Bond album, you had Dawes Butler and Don Messick and all those people. And that's it. That James Bond album is outstanding. So mm -hmm. a lot of them, they, I think it was a matter of, again, those records were low budget, four kids. They had to be made very fast. So the session times were probably real quick, get them in the studio, move on. Yeah. And if they were available, we got to use somebody. Can you do the voice? You know, give it a shot. You know, Barbera used to, when he had the cast for the shows, he would go around the room. Can you do this? Can you do this? I have a feeling that's what happened here. Yeah. It was like, we can't get so-and-so. Can you do it? Give it a shot. You yeah. know. And, and sometimes they went the extra mile, like they got the Three Stooges on one and Bill Dana yeah. on one and things like that. So you know, <laughs> it's pretty neat. You know, it's it's pretty neat. And they they're 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 time capsules of the mid '60s because there's loads of LBJ jokes and things like <laughs> that. I never got, but I get now. But you know what? Talk up to kids. Let them let them figure the jokes out. Right. Why not? And I thought the songs were kind of odd when i was a kid but now i appreciate them because they're surf rock and garage band rock and <laughs> that was theta for its day no disney certainly wasn't disney was doing jazz and they they the jungle book album was very much like a hanna barbera album but nobody was doing that kind of music on a kitty album in 65 right. nobody mm -hmm. you know so i i don't know i i loved them whether they did it or not so uh, I, maybe i'm you know I'm, i sound like an apologist and, and to a <laughs> yeah. I, you know it, it's it's fun yeah about those uh hbr records um people ask me this because you know i you know because i have animation knowledge and stuff like this but i'm not as in tune with all the records as you are i have quite a big collection though but People ask me things like, how come those HBR records aren't on CD or available more easily now? You know, because they command big prices, especially if you get the original pressings. Uh, is there a rights issue on that? What's the deal? Or do they think nobody's going to buy them or what? Oh, it isn't for lack of trying. Because <laughs> the only one that I know that came out, and I have it is on CD, is the Pebbles and Bam Bam Christmas album. And I go, of all the ones to choose to put out, that's probably like the lamest one, I think. <laughs> yeah, they, uh, they they did a nice job, though. They, they put two of the songs in stereo, and yeah. they made 
beautiful blue label. You know, they made that part of the package. They yeah. did a gorgeous job, and I found, I tracked down the guy. I said, let's do some more. He said, okay. And in typical Hollywood uh, fashion, nothing happened. Yeah. Um, before that, I, I went to Rhino Records because I had been working with them uh, on the Toon Tunes albums um, and on the Billboard Family Classic series in the 90s. So I had a meeting with them. And at the time, they were doing the Rhino Handmade series, and they did the Josie and the Pussycats and the Banana Splits, and, which were outstanding. Right. And so I had a meeting with the guy who was running that. I brought the albums with me. I spread them out on, on, the, on the conference table. I said, these albums, people love them. Some people buy them just for the covers. Yeah. But they're really cool, but you got to market them to their handmade kind of people. They're not really kids... Kids would like them. They're really part of that time, and the music's part of that time, and the jokes. You know, it's a dual thing here. I think, you know, I think they'd be fine for kids, but they're really aimed at collectors. And the guy said, you're absolutely right. We'll put out two on a disc per month. So the world was my oyster, and then he got, he got laid off or he quit. Uh. You know, so we've come close a lot. There's one other Hanna-Barbera that was released on CD, but it was one of the pop ones. It was the golden hits of Louis Prima. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's not mentioned except in the liner notes where it originated. It's a good album, though, because mm-hmm. he re-recorded all of the songs, uh, especially for it in stereo. So it's quite a good album. Uh, it's interesting because they didn't release his Pensate Amore from Man Called Flintstone on vinyl, but they gave him a whole album. So go figure. <laughs> that is. But... Um, it's it's a constant. It's I mean I'm I'm always trying. There are all kinds of reasons. It, I don't know if it's a rights thing or just reaching the right person that you can convince that anyone would want them. They, I don't I I don't think they could possibly market them to kids now. No. Because the big companies, Disney's the same way. Their attitude is, we want to sell millions, not thousands. Well, it's That's also why. pre pre Scooby Doo Hanna Barbera, which basically means no release, but it's just well, weird that none of them ever came out or even a compilation of them, you know, like the best material from, you know, you know, and you well, have just little snippets, but I guess that takes effort and time and whatever. <laughs> you do have to pay rights. Uh, you do have to, <clears throat> have to pay the, the people who are on them. Mm-hmm. Because, oh, the, at least in the case of Mel Blanc, he, he made, sometimes more money on records and commercials and uh, things like that than he made on some of the cartoons he worked on. So I think even the voice actors or their heirs would have to be compensated. So there is a money issue. That they, they, always, they call it return on investment. Would they make enough yeah. um, and would they sell enough? And it's never really, I don't think that the Golden reissues have never have done well enough and had the, had the circulation. You can put out terrific stuff, but if you don't get the marketing behind it uh, and and the uh, circulation, then it's really hard to sell them. Yeah. I can always the, the golden stuff has always been marketed, uh, and this is the toughie marketed to kids, and kids aren't the ones buying it. But how do you sell children's records to adults? Well, you have streaming services now, and you have ba- banner ads, and you have sites, and I believe in in and it's amazing these companies haven't embraced it, but I believe in. Um, uh, long tail marketing and going after niches and, and then you, you tabulate the, the profits based on multiplied niches. But big companies don't think that way. They think in terms of, well, Frozen's making us millions and Marvel's making us millions and Scooby-Doo's making us millions. And so we're going after that because thousands don't add up. Um, I, I, it's a constant, it's a constant thing. I don't say, I never say never. That's my motto. No, you say never. Are you working with anybody at the present time or on any of well, these? I know you did the golden ones as you mentioned, you know, uh, that came out in the late lot, 80s. <laughs> with Warner on Tom and Jerry, um, worked with uh, Universal on uh, Rankin Bass reissues. Um, and uh, uh, two years ago, we did reissues of Santa Claus is Coming to Town, Rudolph and Frosty. Oh, yeah. And did, uh, there was a documentary on there. That was real nice, really nice. And 
Uh, I was in that, and I did the commentary for Santa Claus is Coming to Town. That's right, you were on there. <laughs> You're refreshing my memory because I oh, go, what? Is... <laughs> they, I just, I just sat down and just talked like I'm doing now. Yeah. For, for fifty-one minutes, just talked, and it was all pretty much in one take. Uh, we didn't go back except one time. I said, "Please go back to when Jessica comes on camera and goes wait." Because that's not Roby Lester's voice. Uh, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> to say at the moment she goes, Wheat! Um, but it was a blast because, you know, I've been quoting Mickey Rooney for years. So, I, you know, not me! And indeed, <laughs> no one. Because, you know, I, it, was, it, was, it was wonderful to be able to give the Mike Sam Singers credit and Roby Lester credit and to say all those things about those wonderful people. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of their best specials ever. Yeah. So being being assigned that was was truly a dream. And this dream year, come. this year's the fiftieth anniversary. Woo! <laughs> no, it, it is. It is. Uh, Maury Law said it's his favorite because yeah. he just felt like everything. Oh, oh, hold on! Oh, I got a dog interruption here. Uh. It only happens when I record. <laughs> Hello? Oh. It's just a package, dogs. Okay. Oh, well, we have this thing. Doorbell rings, even on TV. Yes. <laughs> I'm actually going to do uh, the video one with Jerry Beck later this week. Because he wants to do it on video. And I go, okay. But trust me, the dogs are going to bark. <laughs> So oh, yeah. I, I can edit this out, you know, now. That's why I do it on audio, because I'm not a good video editor. I mean, I could learn, but uh, it's more complicated than just splicing out a little bit of the digital. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> silly dogs. Thank you for listening, and thank you, Greg Airbar, for being my special guest. Episode number 89 with part two of this interview will be coming soon. If you would like to comment and or be a guest on this podcast, please drop me a line at funideas.mark at gmail.com. Become a patron of Mark Arnold and Fun Ideas Productions. If everyone listening just contributed a dollar a month, that would be a tremendous help in continuing the production of my books and this podcast. Also, subscribe to my YouTube channel. The opening and closing music for the Fun Ideas podcast is provided courtesy of Andrew the Slow Poisoner Goldfarb and is used with permission. This has been the Fun Ideas podcast. This is Mark Arnold speaking. This episode is copyright 2020, Fun Ideas Productions. Thank you and good night. Headed home to a cardboard hut with duct tape doors. I'm paying Be glad it isn't yours Now get up Crap Mountain 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 Get up That mountain Don't fall back Don't fall back Don't fall back